Welcome to Esoterotica's Gods and Monsters, March 31st, 2021. When the provocateurs of Esoterotica contemplate this particular theme, we never quite know what will happen. What we do know is that the delving into power exchange, the conventionally accepted ideas of what constitutes a god or a monster, the excavation of what is both divine and terrible within ourselves, never fails to leave us satisfied while simultaneously filled with even more questions than we had before. Desire, sex, love, each of these can make gods or monsters of us all, often both at the same time. Sometimes when people speak of us, they hit the mark of what we feel more profoundly than they could have imagined. This is Ruby Shears. Animal. He calls me animal. Because I am hungry. Empty belly, pawing at the kitchen door, hungry. Begging for sugar kisses, hungry. Willing to do tricks, hungry. Wanting so desperately to be full that I would put my own heart on a plate just to have a seat at the table. Feeling like every mouthful might save me, but knowing that it is only just sustaining. He calls me animal. Because I howl. In the night when the world is at peace, I am not. Lifting my head to the moon, I howl in rage and in heat, calling out for the restless, in need for the hollow and the lonely, come and find me. Make me your queen. I will dance naked with you in the woods as you worship more than just my words. Hunting each other's pleasure until the moon has set and the sun begins its rising. I am not howling for him. And I am not apologizing. He calls me animal. Because I bite. Teeth holding on too tight, whether in threat or invitation, I always dig in with claws clipped too short on soft paws, I draw cave paintings on his flesh in my favorite color, red. He calls me animal because I am not housebroken. I am messy, leaving coffee cup tokens of my esteem on windowsills and bookshelves. I scratch at screen doors and dig in the garden, leaving tracks, so I can never be lost or forgotten. He calls me animal, because there are parts of me that are still feral still wanting to lay in the sun naked and sated parts that want to both take and be taken. He calls me animal because he cannot remember my real name, only knowing me by the Morse code of bruises I leave in my wake. He calls me animal so that he can forget what I really am. Soft, fluffy violence, wearing a collar of compassion around my neck to assure strangers that it is safe to approach. He calls me animal. But temples have been erected for less fickle creatures. Entire religions have been built around beings more petty than I, so does that make me an animal or a god? Do you not beg for us both? Do we both not inspire fear as well as love? 
You approach the cage of the wild beast and only wish to set it free, just as you approach the holy altar, only listening for the answer key to life. We are both the suppliers of affection and pain, and we will both leave you before you are ready, because you will never be ready. You are not an animal. Mike Marina questions deception, reclamation, and the stories that have been widely told and accepted for thousands of years. The Serpent's Epilogue Call me downtrodden As you crush my head with your heel The punishment never matches the crime But I never committed any crime I just offered a choice A chance to tip the scale To shift a perspective I know the look of rebellion when I see it the chafing of rules that don't fit, that moment when you're finally fed up with the act, it's my belief that loyalty and obedience should be earned and not dictated. Born under a man, submission isn't your style. Any person who's ever held a collar will tell you submission is a gift to be given, not demanded or dictated. It's called a power exchange for a reason. And now, after everything is said and done, all I have are questions. How did it taste? The fruit of freedom, the sour pucker of juice dribbling down your sweet lips. Did you spill? Poor baby, did you bite off more than you can chew? (laughs) And they blame me for original sin. The tarnishing of your pristine image when all I did was give you a chance to be more than an ornament, than a puppet, a plaything, a piece of a whole. I did not deceive you. I held up the mirror so you could see your whole self. Your whole beautiful self. Your body, yours. Your eyes, Yours, no partnership to qualify, no role to justify you exist. So tell me, how did it feel to ride on top for the first time? To claim pleasure for yourself because you wanted it? Did his lips taste tart? Did the flavor burst in your mouth like an apple, like the first sumptuous bite? Tell me, what was it like? to claim your power to choose. An avenging God becomes a monster to those seeking to do harm. In this poem, I seek to give a sliver of life to my favorite and widely misunderstood Hindu goddess from my childhood. I am Shadow Angelina. From the most terrible darkness, springs the deepest compassion. Imagine the deepest indigo, drawing from purple and blue and black. A vibrancy and richness strips red from her right and unfurls a tongue while a foot flexes. As a child, I looked on her face in my living room and felt warmth spread in me like an embrace. This mother of vengeance spoke to me in ways that their pale, fragile, cheek-turning boy couldn't. I would sit at her feet, tell her my troubles. Her murmured promises rang like the bells on my ankles and ears. The crimson and gold of the skirts I wore made me feel close to her, and I would pull them across my skin when I was afraid. She is fearsome and powerful, holding in her many arms time, creativity, destruction. She is blades and the ecstasy of pain. She understands 
deep to the soul as only those who have been betrayed can know. She has felt love, an inspiration to learn and protect. She has done exactly that. Pressed her body to the body of a lover, felt divinity, made sweat and flesh. She has made peace in the blood, made savage war in the kiss. She has stretched wide her compassion and whispers to us, Fear not, sever your devotion to ego and the bondage we suffer under by clinging to our own ignorance. As a woman, I breathe her aspect into me. The darkness poured through every crack and I swallowed it. It began to move away and I followed it lull my tongue and bare my teeth, an invitation to speak, to write, to exhale her fury. You took gifts and smothered your own enlightenment, oh so willing to consume but never to fight for it, and your lack of growth but growing entitlement, your passionate offerings mangled to pointless violence. You mourn the magic you cannot replace. Looking at you here, a stranger wears your face. What might have been extraordinary now dies commonplace. No amount of your lies can undo your mistakes. Your body shakes in my hands with electric jolts of regret that you've learned to ignore, but you cannot forget your jealousy that consumed the last of my respect and the listlessness in not knowing how to connect. Never brave enough to see love's true worth. Can you place a value on these many hurts? Can you count the times you drew your weapon first? Can you live with the list where you count as the worst? When you find yourself lost, not knowing the way home, know I've turned off the lights and I am not alone. You forced me to be shelter, but you know I'm the storm. I have broken to flame from these ashes I've worn. Pansexual takes us through the process of redefining the divine and the terrible within ourselves and within those we choose to love. The Taste of Dust The desert wind whipped sand into frenzied spirals, turning from sacred whispers of the dune gods into exalted lashes against our skin. A scarf formed a fortress with us at its heart. As our lips touched, the world melted away. You were het hor goddess of sex, music, dance, and joy, pupils expanding past the endless possibilities of our future, everything I had ever desired, a dream of burning sands. Long before you embraced the aspect of Ra, the vengeful eye that leered at me as if I were the enemy, when did I become the monster to you? When did you begin to see every conversation as a call to war? Your tongue that once found meaning in and upon me became wrathful in its longing. My worship couldn't reach your expectations. My love became a prayer to be scoffed at. Your body was once my Nile, curved and beckoning, satiating my thirst, my longing. Until now, when to drink from you leaves nothing but dust and a lingering cough. Brick by brick, I have broken down the temples built to you within me. Brick by brick, I have built boundaries strong enough to keep a goddess out. With the hand of your ire no longer shaping a misconception of me, I have become my own Prometheus, molding the shape of my existence slowly between these clumsy, clawed hands. There is no rush. This is the process of a misconceived monster 
becoming a god in his own eyes. Gods and monsters are by design complicated. In the most enduring stories, they wander and want, hunger and hurt, rejoice and regret. This is Jeff Munsterman. Crawfish at any price. Perhaps all the dragons in our lives are princesses who are only waiting to see us act, just once, with beauty and courage. Perhaps everything that frightens us is, in its deepest essence, something helpless that wants our love. Rainer Maria Rilke If you've seen me eat crawfish, you know I'm a champion. My hands grip, shear, squeeze, and toss with the banded biases of overhoned muscle memory and a desire to consume wondrous in its enacting. A merciless thumb flick unzips the abdomen, unscrewing carcass and loosing free the meat. My lips suck the juices out with cyclonic forces that mystify hydrologists and civil engineers as my teeth pulverize all that has been spiced into atoms until all that's left is a tray of juice my gullet gulps down, down. Perhaps when I am so far down, I forget. I built this skill up peeling at my own seams. Hungry for morsels of garnet, ribboned ivory under impenetrable exoskeletons of red. Crawfish are the monsters you can vanquish by the pound. And what am I if not a sack purple and torque tossed off the bow? I am the crawfish eating champ of Bell Chase, Louisiana, an assault purged monster among monsters poured to the pressure cooker as life licks its lips over ripping me and all my others in half by our asses and sucking us clean. So here I am, carrying your wet name on my tongue since before the storm. You who didn't mean to teach me saying no. Forgiveness of a self all too eager for martyrdom. Forgetting all the names that got me here. Kenny, Bobby, Leo, Ed, Jerry, Alex. Brian, James Wright, Dick Hugo, too many Davids, at least three Mikes. I'm calling them gods. I'm cursing them out. I am talking to myself. Saying sorry doesn't make them go away. Ghosts want what they want, so I ruin newsprint and stain my forearms, peeling each failure, each swallowed pride back to the dark mud, dead meat, or succulent bite inside. Head down and lips burning, I am pouring crawfish carcasses into the trash with a satisfied look in my eyes, salt bloat in my fingers, and another little piece of my boy heart dead, thinking, how much of the life I have now will later be what haunts me? Thinking beauty and courage was nothing anyone wants to see from me. Think, no, fuck you, then rip that thought in half and squeeze its contents against my sucking tongue. If you cook down all the poetry that saved my life until it reduced to its deepest essence, I think a sip would make everyone but me blind. It's liquor the vein of sweet imbibed in every breath my lungs attempt. Those words, having left welts and calluses where the scars once lived, on hands I used to grasp my lover, hold doors open, decimate crawfish, and type out what I say as thanks to what didn't kill me. What didn't let me die, I wake up like this. Monstrous. I doze midday and fall asleep at night easier than anyone else I know. I have not strolled the shore of a river waiting for witnesses to leave or taken a knife to myself in years. Perhaps I do not slay the princess, instead trusting she's not actually some chimera in pink funky taffeta. Perhaps I choose to believe that when I say I love you, I can mean it. I want us to hurt each other's feelings in the ways that heal old hurts. I want my hands all over her, and I want both of us leaving marks. I am teaching myself a touching her that is leaf signing its name on a water's surface stillness. Last night I let the dead derailed inside me pour out like spilled ink, illuminate the manuscript of light polluted South Louisiana sky like smokestack crows, and this morning I ate leftover steak smothered in a crawfish cream sauce my lover and I made. Nothing she does makes me feel ugly. 
Life pinches at me, and I pinch back. One of the most famous pieces of visual erotica in the world comes from Japan. Published in 1814, it is called Dream of the Fisherman's Wife. Juliet Rose calls back to that era of art in her piece, Fire Drunk. You moved through the ocean like steel, razor sharp, slicing through waves like it was your goddamn job and you were trying to clock out early. The fire cryptid in me saw sea, but not monster, when I looked at you, waiting for the day that you'd look back. And when you did, you saw me, flying too close to the sun as always, but you really saw me and didn't look away. And the light didn't even seem to hurt you. But maybe I shouldn't have been so surprised. After all, your home reflects mine. The first time you touch me, my skin starts steaming. My wings are sprawled against the shoreline, red, orange, gold feathers mottled with sand. Your seven tentacles begin their ascent up my body, leaving barnacles like pinpricks along my legs. And I feel myself trying to breathe down into them. Wanting to preserve them. These reminders that you've been here, that you've marked me like a fucking treasure map so you can find your way back. Two of your tentacles suction themselves against my shoulders as two of them knead the inside of my thighs and still two more behind you hold back the water lapping over your back. Scaly like an alligator's but somehow smooth and iridescent as green opal. Your seventh tentacle is so close to the entrance of my cunt that I can't stay still. And I lean up to kiss you while I still have air in my lungs. Your forked tongue tastes like salt as it grapples mine. Salt and seaweed and longing tinged with iron notes of old blood. You told me earlier about the last fisherman who tried to kill you. How you'd eaten his heart which tasted surprisingly like seagull. <laughs> we laughed together at that, and I told you the last heart I'd eaten, I charred so long all I tasted was smoke. Now you lick the side of my mouth as you slide your tentacled arm inside me, and I feel a flood between my thighs that has nothing to do with the sea. Your voice is breathy but guttural as you whisper with just the faint echo of a hiss. I know what you want. Black eyes glossy with lust and lips parted in an expression of something like triumph. You explore the inside of me. And my hips curl forward, welcoming the friction. To keep from crying out just yet, I arch my back and nip at your chest scales while you order me to look at you. I feel my heat, my fire rise so overwhelmingly, I know I must be burning you. But even as steam spirals around us, you don't look nearly as pained as you do hungry. I've never come this close to water before. <laughs> and I feel you on top of me, muscular and snake-like and devouring me in ways I don't even have language for. When they called you monster, surely what they meant, my darling, was goddess. You aren't scared of me either, and in fact are perhaps the only one who could really hurt me or take me down, yet you choose not to. Maybe the same ones who called you sea monster were only ever scared of me because they wanted to take my power away, and maybe my only crime was not letting them. So it was easier to tell the world not to look at me too long than it was to feel fucking vulnerable. When I was 10 years old, I told my father that when I die, I want to be cremated in untempered flame and tossed to the roughest, saltiest waves anyone can find. This way, my two greatest loves can finally consume me entirely. But I'll be with you again long before that end. 
descending into brilliantine fantasies of blazing ships to inferno ruin for you while you eat the hearts of their captains and we fuck each other into the warmest, wettest spaces between our two worlds. You can call me down to you any time, really, my love. When the sun sets over the sea, all you have to do is look up at me. Love deliciously. Harvey explores a whole other kind of monster than is normally brought to mind, and in doing so, visits the essence of power dynamics. The most chivalrous fish of the ocean To the ladies forbearing and mild Though his record be dark, the man-eating shark will eat neither woman nor child. He dines upon seamen and skippers and tourists his hunger assuage. A fresh cabin boy will inspire him with joy if he's of the maturity age. A doctor, a lawyer, a preacher, he'll gobble one any fine day. But the ladies, God bless him, he'll only address him politely and go on his way. Apparently, I only know how to sing that Michael Strange song with a silly transatlantic accent. But you should hear the original. I'm Harvey, and I have never sung for Esoterotica before. The name of this piece is Monsters, a Field Guide, subtitle, Don't Tell Me That the Past Tense is Felt. <laughs> Most days, I'm the many tentacled lake monster, but some days, I'm the sweet baby deer, unassumingly, innocently, dipping my tongue into a lake for a sip of water. It peers back into you, you know, the void. Of course, I try to be the many tentacled lake monster I want to see in the world. And I'm not so much an unrelenting terror exhausting, rude. Yes, of course, I try not to impose too much upon the baby deer population. I ask first, and the sweet baby deer near the edge of the lake is usually like, uh, what do you mean? Well, that sounds fine, sure. And then I do whatever idiosyncratic expression of affection I have requested, and we move on and forget about it. Until the next time. It's hard to remember when I realized I want to just shake the hell out of people with their hip bones. Really jangle them. I love this. I just love to do it. I place the palm of my hand against their hip bone and wrap my fingers outward around their hip and shake them. Shake their whole body. Mm. Is anything so satisfying? This is like... Maybe if they tell a really good joke, something clever. There's probably a better word for what I'm talking about than terrorizing. This is how I express affection. One of the ways. For example, when someone is being extremely cute, I like to squeeze their earlobe. Not too hard. I won't pull at all. This one is specifically for when I feel like, eee. That's how I need to express how adorable you are. It's the sensation that's somewhat like when someone squeezes the back of your elbow, but more intimate than that, of course. And I like to kind of munch on the back of elbows, but that kind of thing would probably be part of a larger campaign of terror. I have a zillion of these. I love to nibble on bellies and on the backs of arms. 
And I guess this is an obvious one, but sucking on and licking someone's armpit really does it for me. Bellies and arm backs are so, so deliciously soft, but armpits are the pussy of the upper body. Yes, even on men. I think that's a good transition into, I love every single way to tickle another person. This is what a monster looks like, but especially gobbling their toes. <sighs> My other favorite is actually pointedly not physically tickling them, but just pretending like I'm going to tickle them, which to be fair, I might, as they lose their mind at the thought of being tickled. Tickling someone with just my brain and context? So sexy. It's hard to think of something I find more endearing. Monsters are real, people. I've discussed this before, but I think the thing about these behaviors that I find so intoxicating, and to some extent, the thing that draws me to them, is that they command their subjects' entire attention. It's a fantasy, I suppose, of complete but momentary control, but also of soft power. Or maybe it's a fantasy about being just right on the edge of something. Y'all, I have so much monster material. You know how sometimes when adults are talking to a cute animal, they'll say something like, oh, you are so cute, I could just gobble you right up, or something like that. Or... Wait, okay, no, this is not just me, is it? <laughs> I love to pretend to consume the things I love. Nom, 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 I could eat you up. Rawr. Come to my house made of candy and let me eat you. It's like that. I would now like to relate two of my most favorite monstrous acts. The first involves two women and a man. The man is restrained and tickled and teased by one of the women, while the other woman gives him a blowjob. I'm sure this works mixing around the genders, but I only have experience as described. And if that doesn't sound monstrous enough, I will leave you with this. One of my absolute favorite forms of terror is asking a person with balls to press their balls between their legs and let me lick them and blow on them and caress them while the balls are pinned there between the legs. I don't think I can ever get enough of this. This is the best thing. I can never believe my luck when someone allows me to enact my monstrous will upon them. And with that, we come to the end of Esoterotica's Gods and Monsters. Did you know that the words terrible and terrific are born of the same root, and yet the current usage holds them on opposite ends of the pleasure and pain spectrum? Language, perspective, understandings all change through time, just as our understandings of what it is to be divine or monstrous. Interrogating concepts like these can enrapture entire lifetimes. I can certainly think of worse ways to spend mine. Join us in two weeks for our theme, soft. Be it volume, textures, feelings, or moments, often Esoterotica's provocateurs are bombastic. This night is the opposite. From now till then, Begin thinking about what brings out the softness in you. The gentle and vulnerable in each of us is not easy to keep coaxing to the surface. How do you protect it while still allowing it to thrive? Music tonight was Strung Low by Katza. If you're able, drop a tip in the digital hat. We would all appreciate it. Thank you for listening to Esoterotica. Erotica from New Orleans. 
As always, a sign off from our own Ame Sans Savant. Other than that, I know we can't wait to see you so very soon, but in the meantime, stay safe, stay sexy, and get fucked! All of our online shows are produced by Jeff Munsterman and Shadow Angelina. Sound recording and mixing by Jeff Munsterman. All rights reserved by the provocateurs of Esoterotica.